Well, I wouldn't be grating cheese, except for we used all the grated cheese for the quesadillas for lunch. So, for my potatoes, I'm going to do cheese, green onion, and sour cream. So that means I have to grate cheese. <clears throat> Let me get this put in a bowl. Hopefully we're streaming. Telling a story about cheese. I'll tell a story about cheese, I think. That all the grated cheese got used up for quesadillas. And you guys put on whatever you want on your potato. We were actually telling a story about one of the favorite additions to uh, prime rib is uh, horseradish. Some people like it creamy, some people like it just raw. Some people put it all over everything, their potatoes, their, their vegetables, their whatever. So, me, I put it all over everything. It goes in my potato, it goes on everything. Meat. Now, horseradish is kind of unique. Um, it, you can get it, it's hot and mild, Whew, breaking a sweat and you know, it's too hot the house. Um, you can get it in jars, you can get it in, on the mustard aisle, uh, Beaver makes a creamy horseradish, it's okay. Um, Silver Spring, which is a big company. And there's another company, I can't remember, make a, a creamy and a hot that's just a natural horseradish. Some horseradish is shredded like cheese or grated. Um, but say people want a creamy horseradish, but it's not creamy coming out of the jar. It's just horseradish that's melted down. To make a creamy horseradish, there's two typical ways. Add sour cream and cracked black pepper or rainbow peppercorns that have been cracked. And you just keep mixing it till the sour cream and the pepper mix throughout and you get a really nice flavor. I love that on my potatoes. Um, the other way, there's a restaurant <coughs> uh, for you guys who maybe some have been there, some haven't. It's owned by Laurie's. It's called the Five Crowns. It's in Corona del Mar. Um, they get rated every year, at least they used to, for having some of the best prime rib in California, maybe in the nation. And one of their signature dishes is they do a creamy horseradish that's so light and so airy, it's just absolutely delicious. But they would never give up the recipe. So what it is, is they take heavy whipping cream, and they whip it, just like you're doing it for a pie, but no sugar and all that stuff. And they add a little pepper to it. And they start spooning in the horseradish once it's whipped. And they put it in a little container. And you put that on your prime rib. And the dairy will start to melt because it's got a lot of butter fat. And it'll just make it phenomenal. It's delicious. But, you know, you got to figure the heavy price of heavy whipping cream right now is ridiculous at almost ten dollars a quart so you don't need much probably half a pint would be enough for the whole household plus a jar of i like hot horseradish because it's not hot it's just more like wasabi it's got a little more kick to it the mild horseradish just has a pickly flavor so i usually mix that up 
um, if I'm not doing the five crown style for like a big party or something, I'll just mix it with sour cream and add the pepper. And I'll put that in my potato, put that on my roast, dip it in au jus. I'll have everything mixed in. It'll be awesome. So I'll have to go check the smoker in a few minutes. But before that, here's the most versatile knife in your kitchen. If you don't have one, you should get one. Uh, it used to be called a 4076 and a 4076F is a flex. This is a semi-stiff. Now it's a 417. It's a Forstner. And the reason I use it for everything is it's easy to handle. It's sharp. It stays sharp. I don't have to mess with it. And I'm going to mix the green onion right in with the cheese because if we don't use all the cheese, green onion with quesadilla works just fine. You know, there was a, a book I used to read when I used to cater. Uh, I don't even remember who wrote it, but they did a second version after I had the first version. It's called Play With Your Food. And what they did, I actually did these for a party one time, but I did it with leeks. You got these little heads up like this they did is take a toothpick and you dick it, dip it into some beet and that will give you red and you make a little mouth and on uh, on leeks since they're a lot bigger I used whole peppercorns or whole cloves and spike them in for the eyes on these since they're small you could use like a sesame seed or something and you punch them in for eyes, and then you can set them up on the table and you have a little cheering section next to your hors d'oeuvres or something like that. So it makes for just something different. People just sit there and see it, and it looks kind of cute, and it's kind of unique, and you spend some extra time to make someone's day, make them happy, make them smile. Um, the book's called Play With Your Food. Uh, if you ever open it up and read it and you walk through a produce section, you'll never see produce the same way again. Um, you'll start seeing pictures emerge out of what you see in produce, which is really neat because if you are a photographer, it's a photographer's eye you're kind of looking through. Um, it's a great book. Um, great table book for like your coffee table, just makes things kind of interesting. Um, just by the uniqueness, some of the pumpkin carvings in there are amazing. Um, I've seen pumpkin carvings, but I never saw things like they put in that book. They were awesome. And maybe you want to do something like that with uh, your child next uh, Halloween. You want to carve a unique style pumpkin that looks super cool that nobody else does because they always carve them from the top most of the time. Most of the ones in uh, Play With Your Food use the stem as the nose and then they carve it from the side, which is kind of interesting. So that's some reading material to try. Um, everything over here is ready, so we're just waiting on the roast when I get it out. I'll put it on the board, wrap it in foil, and we'll let it sit. And uh, we'll let the temps run. I'm looking for a temp 
nobody likes rare here, so <clears throat> everybody likes medium rare, medium or well. So very, very rarely do I like rare. So we're gonna do internal temp of right at one thirty five to one forty in the center, which is rare to or medium rare to medium. <clears throat> and that'll be probably one forty five plus uh, pushing 150 on the well done on the ends. So, <clears throat> um, Essie wants an end and she typically likes more on the well side. The rest of the house, who knows? So, um, I'm figuring we got a while cooking. I can, I got to get these potatoes in to get the skin crunchy. They're going in the oven at 350 for about another 30 minutes. I want to get the skin to get that baked crunchy that you just don't get in the microwave. Then I'll pull them out and I'll split them. You might be here with me. I'll pull them out and split them. And I'll mash some of the potato that's really hard to get in the sides. And I'll throw some butter on them. Then I'll throw the cheese mixture. And then I'll throw the green onion. And then they're going to go back in the oven. And I'll switch to broil at 400. And melt off all that when we're getting close to serve. Meanwhile, we'll probably flip camera. And I'll start sauteing the asparagus. And doing those in groups and get that done. But I want to wait till the roast comes out because those last few things are only going to take like five, ten minutes. So I really don't need a lot of work. Need my little baby ceramic steel. One thing I'll tell you ceramic steels are great, they put a very fine, sharp edge on. They just straighten all the nurgles that are rolling off because. The problem most knives are dull. It's not because it has no edge. Well, eventually that'll happen. It's because the edge gets curled. <clears throat> and a steel is intended to straighten that edge. Well, being such a fine edge, the metal is brittle on that fine edge. So as you steal it a few times, some of that edge will break off. And that steel, most steels are magnetic, like my regular meat steel. Um, and they'll get you down to a really good point. The ceramic, the glass, allows you to hone it even sharper, down to like razor blade sharp. You just need to run it a couple times just to smooth out the little rough spots in the edge to get it just nice and smooth so your knife drives a lot better. And the more your knife drives a lot better, the more you drive a lot better. Because a dull knife is substantially more dangerous than a sharp one. Everybody says, no sharp knife, it'll cut right through. No. Sharp knife, because you know where it's going, you cannot have your hand in the way, and it'll just go right through. A dull knife, you're having to put pressure and move it and grip it, and then all of a sudden it goes, and your fingers are there, and that's how people get cut. Um, I don't use straight knives like this to cut tomatoes. Uh, typically, you'll mash the tomato and it'll be all over the place. I use a small serrated knife because the skin's so tough. So that way it glides through, it glides through, it glides through, doesn't mash the tomato, and then I can flip it over and chop it. Um, using the right knife for the right purpose. A paring knife, most people... When you're paring things, you're usually peeling and then cutting. Well, a paring knife typically only has one edge. It's got a straight edge on one side and like a 45, 35 degree angle on the other because you're peeling. If you put a double edge on a paring knife and you're peeling and it's sharp, you'll go right through the peel and right into your thumb. Um, most of the guys will tell you in produce, all their knives have a single edge. Um, not a double edge, because the intention is different. What you're using it for is different. They're peeling little bits and pieces off various fruits and vegetables to make them cleaner so they're more presentable for you to eat. 
They're not sitting there cutting through sinew and fat and everything where they need that second edge to drive through. Um, for those of you who never see me, you might be able to see me now. You're on. You can see my beard. <laughs> Which I started growing the day I left the USDA on injury after being there seven and a half years as a GS7-5. Um, I'm on uh, disability retirement due to my injuries. <clears throat> so I was a meat cutter for 28, 29 years. You never really stop being a meat cutter. Um, because you always just go back to your roots. And then I was an inspector for seven and a half, almost eight years. Then they retired me disabled in the end of almost beginning of 2016. And I've been disabled, retired for a few years. Um, I'm 57 or maybe I'm 58. I don't know what. Well, like the I think I'm 57 this year. You're 57 like the I'll be 58 next year. And when I hit 62, then I'll go to full retirement. Um, but what I'm trying to do is show you a lot of things that are kind of lost. I'd like to do a lot different things, a lot of different things that we just don't do anymore. Uh, you can't even buy them pr processed anymore. Um, I wanted to do a turducken. Instead, I did a uh, stuffed chicken, boneless stuffed chicken, whole chicken. I just, it's hard for me because I don't have enough people to serve for a whole turducken. I did three types of turkey during Thanksgiving. I did a light dark, which I boned a whole turkey and boned the, all the dark meat and de sinewed it. And then I rolled that inside the breast and did a light dark. Um, we used to get those frozen back, I don't know, 30 years ago. And you get a light dark frozen roll for some people who couldn't do a whole turkey because it's just too much. And then I did a smoked turkey breast. Um, I did that with apple. And I also did just a regular turkey. I made coleslaw. Um, God, what did I make? I made all kinds of stuff. Stuffing, homemade mashed potatoes. It's the only way to go. I mean, potatoes are cheap enough. They're easy enough. Um, I should have made... Uh, rebake potato skins, but I might do that with the, the leftovers with this. I might rebake them and add some of the cheese and the green onion to it. And I have bacon outside and rebake those skins and have those for appetizer, hors d'oeuvre, quick snack, whatever, tomorrow while I watch and see what football games are playing. Uh, big game day is going to be you know, New Year's Day, of course, all the bowl games are going to be rolling. And then the next big event is everybody who wants to get ready for a Super Bowl party. A lot of people go out. A lot of people do like a, a checkerboard thing, uh, a pool to try and win something. Um, I was hoping to get 100 subscribers by the first of the year. It's, it, maybe maybe I get close to that by Super Bowl. Um, some events happen where the whole house was sick with stomach flu for two weeks. And with that, you know, there's not really much, you know, you don't feel like eating. You don't really feel like cooking. Um, we're still in a kind of chowder season. I might uh, do a corn chowder. I've been thinking about it. Show you guys the easy way to do a corn ch chicken corn chowder. Um, you start with a cream of potato base, and then you add in what you want. 
which is kind of cool because you don't have to spend all the time making a roux, making a bechamel, then turning around after the bechamel, they it's cook your potatoes and put in the potatoes and the onions. It's a base for also a clam chowder. You can start with cream of potato and add in minced clams and their juice. You could add in crab meat. You could throw shrimp in there. You can do whatever you want. I used to make seafood chowders starting with the same thing. I'd start with that base. Um, <clears throat> you know, my channel is about kind of showing you guys things, but also showing you how you can stretch your dollar. I want to show you that, you know, you don't have to eat the same thing every day. And, you know, you might be able to make a couple good meat buys. And it might be a lot of meat for you now. But if you're going through it like I am, I go through everything goes to my freezer is gone in less than two months. So I was going to make some. I made uh, shepherd's pie a couple weeks ago. Um, I can show you guys a quick cheat for that. <clears throat> uh, an interesting cheat for shepherd's pie since we just passed Thanksgiving. And some of us didn't use all our stuffing mix. So you throw your stuffing mix in a food processor and you blend it. And for about eight ounces of stuffing mix, you use about three pounds of ground beef for yeah, eight ounces to a pound. Because stuffing mix has celery, carrots, um, onion, usually some seasoning in. The only thing you need to add... One egg per pound. If it's one pound, you need one egg. Two eggs, two pounds. Three eggs, three pounds. You need that binder in there. And the stuffing mix, once it's ground nice and fine, what you do is you use warm water. And you put it in a cup and just enough warm water to absorb the crumbs. And then you just keep stirring it until it expands. Then you mix that in a bowl with your meat. And there's your meatloaf. Um, you didn't have to, most of these crumbs, uh, most of the seasoning mixes is already seasoned, unless you're using raw crumbs, and then you could season it. But most of the uh, stuffing mixes, you can have box, stovetop, will be chicken, there'll be beef, there'll be pork, it don't matter, they all, it's just the stock, dry stock they're using. Um, you just use that and put a bag in the food processor and blend it and then add water to it and mix it into your meat. And there's your meatloaf. Now, if you're making shepherd's pie, I make homemade mashed potatoes. You just boil potatoes and mash them with milk and butter. And I would start the meatloaf in a pan, 350 in the oven for, it's going to take, three pounds will probably take an hour. And I'd go about, Two thirds of the way through. So I got about 25, 30 minutes left. And then it would spread the potatoes all over the top. And then some people like ketchup, some like pasta sauce, some like cheese, some like whatever you like. Put it on the top, put it back in the oven, let it go for another half hour, 30 minutes. I guarantee you, by the time you pull that out, let it rest for about 15, 20 minutes and slice it, you're going to have. An amazing shepherd's pie, and it's so simple. Just ground beef and taters, and probably two of the cheapest things. I saw ground beef was up to almost $5 a pound, and that's ridiculous. I mean, we used to get, you know, 30%, which is good for meatballs and loaf and stuff like that. 22 is typically what I use. I run my meat about 17 or 18 I don't like the super lean. It has no flavor. It tastes like leather. Um, it's going to sweat off the juice. A little extra juice isn't going to hurt you. And uh, it's time for me to go check temperature on the roast. So I'll leave you for a minute. And you guys can look at cheese and onions. Doesn't look like I've added anybody. Oh. 
What time is it, Babs? I can't read it from here. 551. Okay, roast is at 70 degrees. It's halfway. Probably looking at 40 minutes. Once it starts to get up there, it'll start climbing really fast. like playing with my cat. And so if you guys are, there's not going to be much going on right now. We got the pies, I got the whipped cream, pecan pie, sorry, I had to get into it. I got a pumpkin as well. Usually I'll make them after Thanksgiving. I just I put in so much work and kind of didn't pay off. And then Christmas dinner, um, it just, we just ate something, <clears throat> had camera problems and other things. So we're doing the after Christmas dinner, which is kind of prep for New Year's. Um, I usually do, this is similar to what I'd do for a couple's dinner if I was going to do a New Year's dinner. Um, I would do maybe something a little different with my potatoes. I might use red potatoes and bake them and cut them into a star. 
and I use uh, Santa Maria, uh, grated Parmesan cheese, uh, diced green on, diced onion, green onion, and uh, black pepper. Well, there's black pepper already in Santa Maria, so, and I mix all that in a bowl. And once my potatoes are done, I cross cut the top and open them up like a flower. And I spread that mixture all over the top. And then I throw them back in to bake for another 20 minutes. So it all melts into the top. You can do a salad. You can do that as a starch side. And then whatever red meat you choose. A lot of people like filet during the holidays. I'll probably use that lifter steak. Um... That's a unique pleasure, better than filet, because you just can't get them. Um, have a delicious dark beer. Some fine espresso stout, like a Yeti. Um, I know a lot of people like Black Butte Porter here in Oregon. Obsidian stout. Um, I want something a little better. Orasputin, one of my favorites. Um... Old raspy would be a great piece or a great drink. And my girl, she'd want a Henry Winery uh, Pinot. Uh, she loves uh, some of their really good high end wines we have in the in the fridge. So that'd be something she'd be into. Um. So another. 35, 40 minutes, we're going to be checking back in, and uh, I'll do the potatoes, I'll get those set it up, as soon as I get the roast out, I'll put it on the board and let it rest, actually I need to switch the board over, I want it on this side, because it's got the grooves, I want it to catch the juice as it's sitting there, because what a roast does, when you go to hard sear, or sear it anyways, however you do it, I did a sear with garlic oil. Some people hard sear. Um, once you seal the outside, all the juice is trapped in the middle and it's racing back and forth. So you got this super hot temperature outside. The roast is super cold in the middle. So all that juice is trying to spew out and run out. But since you sealed it in, it's stuck. So... Now you get the roast off the grill, and the roast is super hot, and the air temperature is cool. So all the juice that was trying to get out is going to now try to get down to the middle, where it's warm and uh, warmer. So it's going to move, and you're not going to want to cut it right away. You need to let it rest for 20, 25 minutes. If you cut it right away, what's going to happen is all that juice that's moving around inside that roast is going to come spewing out and all over your board. Instead of having this juicy, beautiful piece of meat, you're going to have a less juicy, can even run dry if you're running on the well side, piece of meat. And uh, you don't want to do that. Just, just leave it alone. Give it time. Let it rest. Let it come back to where it's supposed to be. So when we get to the roast and it's sitting here on the board and I'll wrap it in foil and let it sit and drive one of my other probes into it for inside the house so I can see what it's doing. Um, then we'll turn the camera around and I'll start the asparagus or I'll start the potatoes right here and get them on the cookie sheet and get them back in the oven. Right now, since the skin's good and got that nice kind of crustiness to it, I don't want to overbake it. I just shut it off and it'll sit in a hot oven. And we're just waiting on the roast now. What are you trying to catch up? Yeah. 
So I'll put out some of the products that I use. Safeway does carry them, Scott's Food Products. Um, I've written recipes for them. This is my prime rib. It's uh, If I had my four peppercorns, I would have beat them and cracked them and rolled them on the outside. Uh, just for outside seasoning. Um, Strictly Pepper has all that in there. Um, I use this as, on salads and a lot of eggs. Every, I put pepper on everything. San Maria, my number one seasoning. You can use it on anything. Vegetables, meat, produce, fish. It's the one I keep in my tackle box uh, just in case I catch some fish and I'm just going to season something somewhere. Garlic oil is a real nice blend. Our house is full of people that love garlic. You can put garlic oil to help seal roasts or fry some shrimp and add some different things or um, whatever you want. Add a little bit to a salad. Put a little garlic oil. Mix it with a little toasted sesame oil. Um, there's another book by another uh, chef. He's written several, and I only have the first one. His name is Michael Rue, R-O-U-X, which is kind of funny. His book's called Sauces, and his last name is Rue, which is R-U-E, or maybe it's R-O-U-X. It is R-O-U-X. It's R-O-U-X. So his last name is a sauce. So, um, he does, the first book's great. It shows all of the traditional old school sauces from lobster thermidor to soups and additions. So if you make a real light, plain meal, you can finish it with a fantastic sauce and it'll just bring everything out. Um, I haven't bought his second book. Um, I used to use it a lot for reference material when I was catering. Um, I don't, I'm not a chef by any means. I'm a specialty meat cutter, a sausage maker. I make about 56 varieties of sausage. Uh, I need to get back to doing that when we get closer to Super Bowl. I need to make some varieties, uh, maybe some Sicilian Make some Wisconsin brats, which I would love to make. Um, and some other stuff. I want to make some whole bacon, too. I want to cure it and put it on the smoker and smoke some whole bacon. I have no problem getting some of the parts. It's, you know, I have to look at finances as well. It's, it's pretty expensive when you're uh, disabled, retired, and you don't have a meat locker. Or you're not sponsored by a meat locker or something like that to be able to put out the products that I'd like to show you. So I try to do things that are economical or within the means that the everyday person can do and show them how to do a bunch of different things. Um, we'll probably do a bunch of different types of stuffed chicken breast soon. Um, Kiev is my favorite, but it's a cholesterol nightmare because it's clove and green onion and everything and it's just balls of butter and it's but I love it oh my god I love it it's one of my favorites it was the first chicken mm -hmm. stuff that I ever made even before I was a meat cutter chicken piccata she likes piccata then you have cordon blues but when you do cordon blues some people do them with a honey mustard in the middle some do them plain some do them with all kinds of various Swiss, some do them with provolone. It's basically ham and cheese in a chicken breast. Um, I do a smoked gouda and asparagus. I've done a smoked cheddar and asparagus. Um, cornbread dressing, doing apple stuffing, doing cranberry stuffing. Um, there's so many different things that you can make off of just one base. I want to show you how to make one simple base, and then I want you to run wild with it. I want you to make up your own recipes, create your own 
stuff for you to hand down to your family because that's how recipes are created in family cookbooks. Somebody went off of some recipe and changed a whole bunch of stuff and made it their own, and then they wrote it down, and that gets passed down through the ages, and it just came out awesome. Um, I still do write recipes for different companies and stuff and do test batches. Um, I haven't done any lately, but I need to get back to doing that again. I just hate to type, so I might text to speech them and then I'll put a bunch of them out there. We have a recipe set up. I just am not a typer. Uh, my hands are used for a blade, not a keyboard. So, we get closer. We should be getting closer. I talk a lot, so I'm a motor mouth. We'll get that roast out. We'll get it resting, and we'll continue on. I figured an hour and a half on the size roast that was. And I didn't even, I didn't weigh it, but I figure it's uh, between five and a half and six and a half pounds. Now we can talk about USDA stuff, <clears throat> since I'm not cooking. I worked in Holcomb, Kansas, at a plant that's a Tyson plant, which Tyson owns IBP. Holcomb, Kansas, being famous for Truman Capote's book, True Blood, which the house still exists there. Pretty sketchy place. Um, Right next to Holcomb, Kansas, is a town, or it's actually a city, called Garden City, Kansas. Everybody that works at the plant basically lives in Garden City, other than the few people that live in Holcomb. Um, usually, that meat plant supports basically an entire city. There used to be two of them, one burned down. It was owned by Montfort back in the day, and basically sits there as just the remains of nothing. And I heard they were building a new plant on that spot. I don't know who built it. Uh, it was after I left. Then I also worked uh, Dodge City, Kansas for National Beef and Dodge City, Kansas for Excel. Um, those are both longstanding. National Beef has a real great high-end meat program. Um, it was really interesting to see how things come in from walking to ending up on your table because we don't we don't get to see that. There's no films out there for beef slaughter, at least not in the U.S. Cameras aren't allowed. Nothing's allowed in to see how beef slaughter is performed. Um, you might see a film on grading. Uh, graders are a different uh, area versus the USDA. The USDA and FSIS, uh, Food Safety Inspection Service, is run by the federal government to oversee slaughter production 
and HACCP and critical control points in the processing of meat before it goes to shipping to your warehouses and your butchers. Graders are USDA inspectors that are hired by the company to grade their beef so they can put a price tag on it and sell it to their producers and know what they're getting over the counter. Um, that's why I said that inspection tag on the outside of the bag is important because it tells you the establishment that this meat came from. And in the case of Canada, it said 38, so it was Canadian Prime. Um, in the U.S., it'll say U.S. establishment inspected inspection by USDA, and it'll have an establishment. Now, if something goes wrong, people get sick, uh, there's all, many a things that can happen with different forms of meat. You can take that, well, you'd have to take it back. If you didn't buy a whole piece, you'd have to take it back to the market. They'd have to look at their invoices and lot numbers and pull their inspection labels. Then that would go back to the plant it came from. Then that would go back to the inspection of the lots that were tested. And that's how recalls happen. So if they're not caught right away, that's how things get recalled. It goes by that establishment label to lot number to what was tested and so on. Um, we have a lot more recalls nowadays with cooked food than we really do with raw. I haven't seen too many ground beef recalls uh, recently. But a lot of cooked product and... Uh, the problem with that, you don't really find so much with E. coli. You find it with listeria and uh, other things. Sometimes salmonella, where you're getting cross-contamination of a cook to a raw to a cook. That's why it's important to, when you're working with stuff, is know what boards you're working on and what's raw, what's cooked, and keep them separate until they all join together on the plate. Because you don't want to transfer any bacteria to a cooked piece of meat that's already been through the cooking process and is cleaned up from a raw piece of meat. Or vice versa. It could be vegetables. Wash your vegetables in warm or hot water. That's not to will them, but to be sure. If there's E. coli on your lettuce salad, you want to get that off. I'm having pear cider right now until this gets ready. We're at 85 degrees.
I'm the only one watching me. That's right. Uh, uh, the longer you stay on, the more you know. Almost grabbed this barehanded. So let's get back to this. Put this stuff away. I think I'm going to put on a glow. These are really hot potatoes. Put on one of my Z grills, my grilling mitts. I'm going to do. I'm going to get in here and start mashing some tater. I'd have a double over on the mic. Oh my god, you turn the TV up and you're making feedback. Oh. That's better. Sorry, people. It's like when you call into a radio station and they're like, turn down your radio. And then the person goes, but I can't hear myself. We were in Kansas when I was living out there. I didn't have any family. One of my buddies. I actually met his mom before I met him. He was uh, my supervisor when I worked at the plant, Alex. Um, his mom sadly passed away a few years ago. What a great lady she was. She was, uh, she worked in the library. I met her at the one Soul grocery store we had in uh, Garden City, Kansas called Dillon's. And she goes, my son's a food inspector. I think he's a supervisor. He works that plant. Well, I haven't even been to the plant yet. So... My... Actually, probably first day or couple week week in town, I met her. Alex and I became really good friends. We used to fish together a lot. Because really not much to do in Kansas. Truthfully, it's pretty damn boring. Um, at least western Kansas. Okay, now what we're going to do make a nice wad of cheese.
when I first got to the plant in Kansas, most of the inspectors are they're okay. They weren't really a tight knit group. As time went on, and we got together to where um, a lot of us have been together for a real long time. The group got a little bit tighter. Okay, those are going to go back in the oven right now. Let them do their thing. And we're going to start asparagus. So, I'm going to ask Essie to help me with the camera so you guys can see asparagus. You can do it. We'll start with a half cube of butter. Uh, probably a third of a cube. I'll go through the whole cube. Mm. So let's see. I don't know what to turn. You guys go on a ride. The magic carpet ride. It looks like a plate of asparagus to me. Uh, not that one. Tighten it. Well, it's there. It's against my tree. It'll work. You're going to make the... You're going to make the... Uh, oh my good golly, dude. Oh, you really, you really adjusted everything on here. Okay. So somebody, somebody who doesn't have AV experience shouldn't be touching the AV equipment. That's why I don't do my self-filming. Oh my God, you unscrewed the whole head of the camera. Sorry, people. Wow. Okay. I'm going to get these all coated. Once you see that, they're going to take a bit, so. What, sizzle cam? Uh, apparently. Just don't turn on this burner right here. The oh, tripod's on it. I'm using this one. You're going to roll these around, get them all nice and coated. And then we just got to let them cook. Why? Why? Because that's what they're saying in the video again. Because that's what they say in the video game. I'm not doing a video game. I'm not doing anything. I'm not doing it on a screen. Now you can get good in the kitchen. 
Well, I'm already giving a tip to them. To be honest with you, I'm the best. I think I want these, if you look at the color, they're kind of light green. When they get really closer to cook, they're going to turn really dark green. And be real nice and shiny. It only takes about five minutes. And you don't want to overcook them. We do not want mushy asparagus. Check smoker temp while I keep it going. Ninety seven. So we got thirty degrees to go. About twenty minutes. That'll get me these done. I have a sample. Mm. Oh, I could eat all this asparagus. Now see if you had Santa Maria, you got Santa Maria in almost every dish, except for I didn't add it to the potatoes, but I could have, and it'd be three different flavors, and you wouldn't even know it's in there, it's just an accent seasoning for the flavor that you're trying to get.
bring my stool over here since all I'm doing is moving asparagus. And having ace pear spider, ace pear cider. Pear spider? Yep. Pear cider. Pear spider. Pear spiders. I think just for sampling, I got an idea. Might as well cook something while you guys are sitting there watching. Little pieces off the ribeye. Uh, we're going to do some impromptu cooking. I didn't have lunch today, even though we're waiting on the roast. The asparagus is going, baked potatoes are going, I need to look at those. Have some asparagus flavored beef. Have a little ribeye tail.
of that prime ribeye, a little bit of that tail that I just threw back in a package. Just be an appetizer for me. I'm not even going to season it because there's plenty of Santa Maria in the... Your oven is heating. Yeah, I know. Oh, I forgot to shut it off. But... You know where my uh, my little plates for putting the hot stuff on? Huh? In the I'm sorry. I'm right there underneath my. Sorry. <laughs> We're going to let that little bits of meat rest. Much as I don't want to. I want to mow it. And that's going to be the rest for my quesadilla later. Hey, Google, turn the dining room light on. Sure, turning the dining room light on. I'm at 103. So we're looking about 15 minutes, the roast comes off, and 
we're done. Oh, that's a bend of asparagus. I'm going to eat it. If you guys don't like fat, this wouldn't be the piece for you. This is all really super fatty meat. Is that nice? Big piece of fat. Mm. Right on the rare. So you can see the asparagus, which I'm eating. You can see the potatoes. Which still got to add sour cream, but they're done. Now when the roast gets done, we're good. These are one of the things that happens when you're cooking fresh stuff. is not always done when you anticipate. 40 degrees outside, so... That temperature is putting a little work on that smoker by pulling temp down. It's been getting real cold at night, so everything in there is pretty cold. Took it a lot longer to heat up than I thought. One benefit to cooking, you get to sample everything ahead of everybody else. Just sour cream.
And there's the cheesy taters. Delicious. Uh, you want to try some cheesy tater? Uh, I gotta get my appetite rolling here. I'm uh, thinking about making myself uh, get myself an eggnog with some liquor in it. I'll make it. Nice little crunch from the green onions. I didn't get a green onion, but I'm okay. Mm. I'll get mine. They're everywhere in there. Oh, that's so good. Not regular nog or pumpkin nog? Ooh. I don't know. I think I'm the only one who likes the pumpkin. I mean, I'll get the pumpkin's pumpkin. fine. I've been down in it. I just don't want to drink it all. How about regular nog? While I make her eggnog with a little brandy in it or something in it, I'll eat potato. I could eat four of those potatoes, they're delicious. flavor you want to add. Put a little drambuie in it. It's got uh, it's a scotch with uh, heather, honey, herbs, and spices. Well, I'm in my for all the people, anybody watching on the stream or watching on the YouTube time machine later on in time. Um, I'm in my chat room and they're talking about alcohol too.
that's fucking good. Here you go, babe. It's more than I can drink. Eggnog with a shot of Drambuie. Little by little, you'll see this potato start to disappear. Look good? Sweating in this kitchen. Working at the sweat. Good for you. Feels good. Okay, down to twenty degrees. I didn't make whipped cream this time. I still have pumpkin ice cream pie. I didn't bring that out. It's frozen solid. i bring it out tomorrow. And uh, we're almost ready to do everything. Just waiting on that roast. So 20 minutes and then 15 minutes to set at least. This is for those moments when the roast isn't done. You got a bunch of people here and you know it's on its way. Just a little cold. I could have done it in the house and had it done. 
I just wanted to do it on a smoker. Um, this is where you entertain. And this is where you break out the cheese and crackers and vegetables and dips and let you, let let all the nibblers nibble. Bust out the cards and the dice. Because you can't speed it up. It's just going to go when it goes. I should have put it on a little bit earlier. Cold and temperature good. Just the roast is a little slow. So the roast gets in, I'll condense the au jus into a stock pot, make the meat juice, boil it down, that'll take a few minutes, and we'll be set to go. Ready to go. Be ready to eat. Standing on the rooftop, shouting out, baby, I'm ready to go. I don't know if you guys will watch this live or if you'll catch it in the after effects after I've already posted the video. We decided instead of stopping it and making a part three, we just let it run. Um, but I cooked through everything, so the only two things left to do is roast us, finish cooking, I wrap it in foil, let it rest on the board, and finish the au jus, and that's it. I think I ate all the horseradish. Remains. We still have two things left at the end of the year. It's before what the meat industry we call the dead time of year. Um, after Super Bowl, our big meat holidays are St. Patrick's. Well, you have Valentine's Day, not a big meat holiday. A good holiday for guys to learn how to cook. So they can impress their date and get some. Oh, my God. And uh, as a meat cutter, we did we did a lot of training on guys how to how to hook it up right. So you know, show, have to show them the new generation that is glued to a video game and never watches actual TV but reality drama and cooks everything from a box. So, they need lots of help. Well, then, good girls need to teach boys how to French kiss right on New Year's Eve night, then. Girls need to learn how to French kiss right, period. So, once you train them how to do that, we got Super Bowl. What are going to be the Super Bowl favorites? Right now... The teams, it's just a giant mess. You got everybody from 11 and 4 to, or 11 and 3 to 11 and five. 11 and four. Uh, 7 and 6 on some of the wild card teams. It's it's a mixed bag. And then with KC playing as bad as they've been playing, especially six straight losses, um, I don't see them making it past round one. They just. They're not playing well. They were playing okay at the beginning of the season. I don't know if it's injuries or the receivers can't catch. It's like they were eating hot wings on the sidelines, and then they go out to play, and they can't catch a damn thing. So uh, I don't have high hopes for KC going to the Super Bowl this year. 
the Ravens are killing it. Um, they just look good. 49ers look good, but they're hot and cold. Um, Denver's another one. Denver and Oakland are hot and cold, too. Sometimes they look great. Sometimes they don't. So, along with the teams, are you going to have a Super Bowl party? Are you going to fix something? And what would you serve? What are your appetizers? Are you going to serve main dish? Or are you just going to do a buffet of a bunch of little tidbits and feed everybody? So, I'm waiting to hear... Um, get a comment here and there. U.S. is a big uh, football nation. So, we still don't know who's playing, but what would you serve? If you're going to have a party, what are you going to serve? Then we go into Valentine's Day, which... Okay. Well, well, we'll deal with that after Super Bowl. Maybe somebody will get lucky at Super Bowl and carry it into Valentine's Day. Um. Then we have St. Patty's Day, the time to drink green beer and spew all over the place. The time for Irish soda bread and corned beef and cabbage, or the famous Reuben or corned beef sandwich. And we'll talk about that one. Um, we might talk about curing your own corned beef. Uh, problem is you'd have to start now because it takes about six weeks to cure. Uh, we'll talk about buying corned beefs, different types and pickling spices and when to use them. Um, we'll talk about the brines, uh, ways to keep your corned beef from being over salty and tricks you can use. And then we're kind of at a dead time of year until Easter. And Easter's a big ham time of year. So you got Easter, then you got Memorial Day, which is the anniversary of my cycling crash in May on my girlfriend's birthday and our anniversary. Um... And then you're back 4th of July, and then we get to go all the way around again. So, I'm from California. I barbecue. It can be four feet of snow. I'm going to barbecue. It can be build the boat. It's been raining 40 days and 40 nights. I'm going to barbecue. Um, I don't care what the weather is. I'm going to barbecue. Um... And I'm basically working with recipes that I typically use in an oven, but I'm going to barbecue. I want to do a smoked chili. I'm going to smoke the beans and the meat. <clears throat> Might smoke the chilies. I want to do tamales. Tamales might be after the first of the year. I got the stuff to do it. I just short the meat right now. And I'm not, and I'm, I'm preferential towards pork tamales, sweet corn tamales, and hatch green chilies that have been roasted and skinned, and Monterey Jack, pepper jack cheese tamales. So, um, if you got a favorite tamale, uh, put that in the thing. Maybe we'll make that one. Uh, so there's a lot of tamales I've never made. Only made them once. I uh, get my four-inch broad knife and spackle the spackle the uh, husk, and then roll it up with meat and put it in the tamale cooker. And then once they're steamed, or maybe I'll just uh, steam them on the smoker and then finish them on the smoker. Put them up on the high rack and smoke them. I'm just trying to do something that's more inventive, more fun than spending all the time in the kitchen where you can maybe sit out on the porch and kick back in the cool air, read a book, listen to some music, and cook your dinner. Time for me to go check the smoker. I think we're going to be just short. Still got a little more time.
I already did food. with asparagus. Bring out the food. One fifteen. Hundred and fifteen. About ten minutes. Well, yeah, about ten minutes. Fifteen minutes. Fifteen more minutes, and we're there. Be one thirty. Full rare in the middle. And once I get it out, that heat's just going to keep going. Once it gets to one twenty, it's going to cook really fast. Actually, I'm surprised that she doesn't have some kind of Christmas New Year's music on. Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad. They can look at the uh, pumpkin pie if they want to. Put this on camera. So it's, a, it's, it's warm right here. I have the Oh, well, good. Then I'll keep the asparagus warm. See, you moved the... There we go. It's a very holiday. We'll put there. We'll, put, uh, we'll do some product placement. And an empty plate where a potato used to be. Okay, what plate are we going to present on? Alright, apparently I have to go and she is... I think it's going to be easiest is to use my grandma's big serving platter. Or for the roast. Sounds like little monsters. It's <clears throat> not an exciting plate, but it's a big one. You put everything on there. There we go. And no stealing the asparagus. I stole probably a whole bunch already. Bust out some of Grandma's china or platters. Should have sharpened Grandpa's knife. The antler, antler handle carving set. Those are things you don't put on a belt sander. Stone sharpened ones you grind them. Time is it is? 7 17. So it looks like we're eating by 8. The roast has 20 more minutes, 15 more minutes. Has to rest for 15 to 20 minutes. We're at 40 minutes. That means everything will be done by 8. And I was off by an hour due to the smoker. And starting late. So if I wanted to be done by six, I started too late. I started at three, I should have started at one. That's the thing with rib roasts is you want them done to the right temp and serve them at the right time. And sometimes things happen. I 
I remember sitting at somebody's house waiting for a turkey to come out. It was frozen and they defrosted it the morning before. It was still frozen in the core when they put it in. I've seen some great turkey disasters like forgetting to pull the giblets and all the plastic and all kinds of things. And don't trust your turkey pop-ups. They come in the breast, stick them in the thigh. They're meant to pop at 180. And if your turkey's 180, by the time you rest it and slice it and everything else, it's going to run a little on the dry side. I always take those things out and run a probe. I run one in the thigh and one in the breast. And whichever one's lower, when it gets to the accurate gun temperature, then we pull it out. Beef, I don't have that problem. I can cook this blood rare at 130. Or I can cook it. Anybody can make it more done. You want black in prime rib? Just let it, let it keep cooking. It'll be black. Want black and spice prime rib? I've never had emeralds, but I've used Perdomes. Paul Perdomes great for black and spice. Some people use mustard and horseradish. I like horseradish on my prime rib, but I don't know if I like mustard so much. Mm, mustard glazed salmon, and then you put it under the broiler. I'm not a mustard fan. I'm a garlic fan. Garlic and pepper. I like simple things. Garlic, salt, pepper, onion. Garlic, salt, pepper, onion. Maybe a little bit of thyme. I could have put some rosemary. I have a rosemary bush in the front yard. That was our Christmas tree two years ago. And one thing about rosemary is once you plant it, it takes over. Yes, it's a pretty hearty little shrub. It's a shrubbery. It's a hearty little shrubbery. Although my Christmas lights didn't get here on time for me to decorate the little Christmas tree. But it doesn't really look like a Christmas tree anymore. It looks like a pot bellied pig in the front yard. Should put the cat timer out there. It's on my coffee bar. The cat timer. I go tick 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 meow. Tick 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 meow.
I can't stop eating asparagus. The problem with asparagus. Can't just have one. Can't just have one to pop, you can't stop. <sighs> Better get your own bag. Can't just have one. Oh. Brianna in the chat room is having prime rib tonight, she says. Wait, prime rib tonight, you hear from a little birdie. I said, oh, Melissa must be saying. Uh, Who's the viewer? You and me? Me? Yeah, on Roku. Oh. The Roku's watching, but it's the monitoring device. Well, it says there's two subscribers on it, so it might be me and somebody else. So if you're listening and you're thinking about your New Year's thing, prime rib's common, surf and turf is common. Get a prime rib and stake it down and do lobster tails and steak. Beef Wellington is common. If you're going to do beef Wellington, um, we're going to have to talk a little bit. It's not as easy as it sounds. Use a mushroom pate to rub down the roast. And it has to be super clean. And you're going to need a whole pismo filet because the tail section is the most tender. And you're going to do it with very, very thin sheets of phyllo dough. And you're not going to want to wrap it too thick because the phyllo dough has to cook at the same time the meat cooks. So you're going to want to portion everything to be uniform in size. Um... It's a little more technical dish to make. Fantastic dish to serve with a really dark red Bordeaux mushroom gravy. Um, very rich. <clears throat> but uh, if there's something you want to try or try to make or something, I'm happy to help somebody with a dish and stuff like that. You just got to let me know in advance so I can contact you and help you work through it. I've worked with everything. If it walks, swims, or flies, I can kill it, cook it, and fix it into something really nice. So, 
I just need to know what you want to do. And give me enough timeline so I can run maybe a test vid or run a vid and we'll try some things. And I'll try and find the best way for you to utilize or make what you want to make. And then you can spin your bounce off it however you want. Um, I don't get enough comments. I get occasional do a vegetarian dish or do this. And I've done a few. I might do something with some soy or tempeh or stuff. But tempeh is just flavored with soy protein that whatever you put it in, I could make buffalo, boneless buffalo hot wings with tempeh, and you'd think they were chicken just because of texture. Um, it's kind of a really unique thing that one of the unique things that vegetarians can do to kind of make their vegetarian life a little more interesting than the same old stuff. Um, but I'm kind of knowing down, I'm, I'm down to chowders and soups, so we're probably going to do some chili, do some hot water cornbread, or make some Johnny Cakes. Um, I know my girlfriend's, she likes chili. I might smoke some of the meat and smoke some of the beans, and then we'll throw it in a it's got a, I don't know what it's called, one pot? What's it called? Instapot. Instapot. They just went out of business or something. Like, they're not going to so have she's got an Instapot, pot, so I'll throw all of that in there and let it cook for hours and hours and hours and make a chili. Hope everybody got their Instapot. I don't know. And then uh, it's kind of like a, a universal crock pot pressure cooker or such. Yeah. And... Uh, I got some tender meat off the sirloin and stuff sitting out there and top around. There's some beef of the <clears throat> of the oven to keep some stuff warm. And if you hear a little squeak in the background, that's Napster on his wheel. Could be chippers on the wheel too, but I think it's Napster. He's always on the wheel. We had a pair of brothers that are gerbils, and they race each other on the wheel. And Napster gets bored, so he runs a lot on the wheel. They had broccoli for dinner, which is their favorite. Broccoli and sunflower seeds. <clears throat> Think that's a simple, that's a good meal for them. I haven't tried them on cheese because rats we used to give cheese, but not the the gerbies. Their diet's different. But sorry for being gone so long. Now I'm back. And we'll finish off the year strong. I consider the end of the year <clears throat> Super Bowl. You got New Year's, which is like the pinnacle. And then you got Super Bowl. That's the last big party. Have friends over, cook something. Um, I know I wanted to do a sushi thing. Uh, we might do that. <clears throat> I don't know. Sometime around uh, in February maybe or I break out the tan make sticky rice make tiger rolls or dynamite rolls or California rolls for the people that don't like sushi and stuff like that uh, and I was looking into the price of wasabi the actual real wasabi costs a lot of money versus the little green thing you get at the sushi store, which is actually more horseradish than the salt. Um, <clears throat> and we got 
pumpkin pie sitting there. I would love it if it was sweet potato pie. It's the only sweet potato I like is sweet potato pie. I can't stand the yams. But it's probably because it's only been served yams one way. With butter, brown sugar, and a marshmallow. And I'm just bleh. And sweet potato is pretty much the same thing. Bleh. But I like sweet potato pie. Pumpkin pie. I think sweet potato pie is better than pumpkin pie. And pecan pie, which is my favorite, which would be up there, but I've already eaten about half the pie. Uh, I only allow myself about one pecan pie a year. Because it's super, super sweet. My great grandma used to make a giant pecan pie. I love that so much. But all my grandmas are gone now. Just mom and my aunt and my nieces and nephews. Me and my brother. That's all there is left. And I'm not in California, so I would I if I was, I'd probably be cooking. Um, I'm in Oregon, so the only family I have right now close to me is my girl, S. My cat, Tiggers. My little fur balls in the other room. Napster and Chippers. And the roommates, Candy and Melissa. At least I know they'll show up for dinner. Should be 120. 120 on the nose. 15 degrees to go and it's climbing. Say about 10 minutes. Now let's see who wants what. So Everybody wants medium rare. So 135 is the done temp. And we wrap it and let it rest. So we still have 15 degrees to go. Be about probably a degree a minute. About 15 minutes and I'll be taking that off. And we're going to let it wrap it up and let it sit. And after it rests, then we'll put it on the platter and we'll carve it up. Time to clean up my carving knife. My everything knife. Now, I don't know where it went, but I got one of these. These right now are about $135 each. I think I paid $40 back in the day, and I probably have five of them. <clears throat> I got one with a white handle, safety handle. It's smart and final. 
for about 20 bucks. And the only difference in this is it's got a plastic handle. It may not have the serrate. It might be a straight blade. But I think I got one that was serrated or non-serrated for about 20 bucks, And it was a steal because, you know, serrations help you push through the meat. But a straight blade's a great carver. Break out the super foil.
Let's see. That's yeah, climbing about a degree a minute right now. <clears throat> and I don't want to go open it up and drop the heat. Set it and let it roll. Just stick your probe in it. Stick a probe in it, let it roll. What is the probe like an axle? Set it and let it. Set it and let it. The more you start moving, open it and closing the door, the temperature drops. You'll be here another two hours. You better, better bring on dinner soon. I'm sitting here drinking this eggnog, this spiked eggnog. Yeah, how is it with the Drambuie in it? Mm-hmm. How is it? It's almost gone. That's how it is. Drambuie is scotch whiskey, honey, heather, herbs and spices. Ooh. High gravity at the bottom. Yeah. Too bad we can't get a big rush to when the meat comes out and I start carving it. Did you put nutmeg in there? Huh? You put nutmeg in there? Just a little bit. It was all at the bottom. Was it? It was the al yeah. alcohol and nutmeg all at the bottom. I swirled it right when you first drank it, so it probably falls to the right. heavier gravity. It's 130. I'll put the other probe in the the other meat thermometer, the red one, mm -hmm. and just stick it in the middle of, after I tent it up with foil and let it rest. Sound. It smells like, I don't know, it smells smelly. Taters are sitting in the oven, but they're on low. Okay. Yeah. Time to check all the things I smell smoke. Oh, a piece of asparagus. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
27. On the room too. Uh, I don't know if she might be. She might be lurking in the room, or she's talking to somebody else who's in the room. Oh. Nicole, somebody. Is, uh, a department store, uh, you think she's Kramer? Maybe she's talking about art or something. I don't know. Almost there. Twenty-nine. Six more degrees.
Where's the bee? It's four minutes to eight. Where's the bee? hanging out here waiting for the uh waiting for the meat to be done temp here we haven't forgotten about everybody out in tv land waiting for waiting for the roast with the mouse What's the dumb temp supposed to be? 135. And what's the temperature now? 130. 130? Are we close? 5 degrees. Apparently we're 5 degrees away, folks. I'm over here starting the fireplace. It's gonna be probably another cold night in Oregon.
says it's only 40 years, but I doubt it. Hey, Google, what's the temperature in Roseburg right now? It's currently 70 degrees, and Eco Mode is set to keep the temperature between 40 and 76 degrees. Hey, Google, what's the temperature outside? The current temperature in Roseburg North is 49 degrees. I don't think so. Three degrees and it comes off. Just waiting for three more degrees. Not ninety six degrees in the shade. Three degrees in the smoker. Yeah. Or it'd be Frank's song. The beans are in the kettle. The soup is, or the beans are in the kitchen, the soup is in the pan. The beans are in the kettle, the soup is in the pot. Soup is in the pan or something. Soup is in the pot. So that was pan. The, the beans Frank are in the soup line, it's gonna, those beans are oh, oh so grand. He used to sing that shit back back when we were meat cutting. Because uh, well, meat cutter never wants you on the line, you're chained to the block forever. You never get out. That's how it goes, indentured servitude. Pretty much. Once you start, you never get out. Working for the man, working for the government. Working for the market. You're chained to the block forever. Chippers is in the nest, so I know that's Napster. The light must be in my hands. You don't even want to know. You'll have to turn off the camera for me to tell you this one. I can't say it on camera. Why? Because I can't say it on camera. What, to say I get a blowjob or something? No, stop. Oh, my God. I'm in the chat room, and I thought I saw something in somebody's thumbnail picture, and then you enlarge it, and it's not what you thought it was. Hey, Internet, you ever do that? Well, you yeah. see a thumbnail on the internet, and you think it's something, and then you enlarge it, and it's not even close to what you thought it was? Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Like, it looks like someone's elbow, and then you enlarge it, and it's someone's butt. Waiting on those three degrees.
That's all right. Those three degrees will be worth the wait. Crispy cheese. Mm. Mm. Don't forget to get all your crispy cheese pieces.
anything on the meat? Yep. Uh, Couple more minutes. It's under. It's resting. Resting. It's resting. By the time the meat's done resting, everybody else will be resting. <laughs> What's the meat? It's resting. Just like a degree, I think I got a tension remedy at this point. Because Probably because it's working out. Well, she had me doing stretches because I told her the shoulders were. Yeah. But the problem is, is I'm feeling like weakness from here. You know your, way, you know your balls that I gave you. Yeah. Do those and do this. Turn the arm this way. Turn the arm this way. Turn the arm this. Then. Put it back as far as you can, and rotate up as far as you can. And then you can do out to the side, too. And just take your time with it, because it's a stretch. It's You're stretching. Pull your arms back like this. You'll pinch your shoulders, your scapula together, and then you can come out like that. The point it is, is that actually, it's, I can't, it's a weird feeling from the trapezoid. Mm -hmm. To the shoulder, down to the elbow. And there is your roast. That would be Essie's piece because it's an end. So you have your asparagus. You have your prime rib. Super nice and juicy. And you have your baked potato. So even though the camera's on, everybody can eat. So let me pull out the plates. Here you go, Melissa. Thank you. All right. Tiny portions of everything for me. Yours is on the plate. Mine's already on a plate. Yeah. Everybody's getting served dinner. Did you do the uh, presentation for the camera? Sit right there. Okay.
Okay. Come explain to me what you've prepared here. Prime rib, Santa Maria, garlic oil, and strictly pepper. Asparagus with butter and Santa Maria and baked potato with Havarte and sharp cheddar cheese. Um, and just baked it once, microwaved it, then baked it to get skin crisp. Then put sour cream and green onion. Done. And there's your dinner. It looks fantastic. I am going to dive into this while it is still juicy and fantastic. Thank you for hanging out with us. Uh, ChasingTheMissingLink.com uh, website. Be doing some some New Year's work on that. It's going to get uh, a fresh coat of paint for the new year. Some updating. Um, again, thank you for joining us. Uh, sorry we had kind of a uh, intermisso in the middle of our cooking. Um, but um, we appreciate you. Keep making the deliciousness in the kitchen. Like, subscribe. Hit us up. Comments. Um, I'm thinking that we might, for New Year's, do a live stream where I get a chat chat box going, and I'll sit with the laptop and maybe answer some live questions. If We're going to have friends over, we, maybe have a little party or something. So we might have a raucous New Year's um, live yeah, stream. That one's a little more, a little more well. Live stream with um, live Q&A, live chat. Thank you so much. Enjoy your dinner.